guys are in for a treat tonight um, for two reasons. One is that you have Peter, and the other is that you have Sid. So uh, Dr. Donovan is the founding director, actually, for this Stem Cell Research Center. He is the reason that we are, along with CIRM, um, he is the reason that we are in this building tonight. Um, he is a phenomenal scientist and actually was um, a tremendous director in terms of bringing people together and making this the collaborative center that it has um, continued to be today. So, Peter, welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, we really appreciate the support, and we also love to tell people about the work that we're doing here. So, what we're going to try and do today is tell you a little bit about the history of stem cell research and the promise of stem cell research, but also talk about the ethical and moral issues associated with stem cell research so that you're a very well-informed uh, audience when you leave, and that when Janice and Cara get back to high school in Portola, sorry to call you out, Cara, um, that you'll know the answers to all the questions. So I'd like to take you back to the late 1970s, uh, a, a big event in medicine when a child was born in Britain uh, after a procedure developing in vitro fertilization where they took eggs from uh, a mother, sperm from a father, and mixed them in a dish, created an embryo, and then transferred that in, back into the mother, and uh, she gave birth. And that technology really developed new ways of treating uh, infertility in couples. And infertility can happen for a lot of reasons, but this was a major breakthrough in the field. And since that time, it's estimated that about six million babies worldwide have been um, developed through that method. And that was a time when people were very interested in the development of human embryos. It provided a new insight into the development of our own species. And people were also exploring this subject in animal systems, in labs, using mice and flies and frogs and so on. And I'm going to summarize a lot of that work in this diagram here, which summarizes uh, the period of very early embryonic development in humans. So down here at the bottom is an ovary. The egg will be ovulated. And if that coincides with sperm being there, one of those lucky sperm will fertilize the egg and produce an embryo. And the entry of the sperm into the egg causes a reaction to begin to then uh, commence development in that egg. And the egg at the same time, the embryo will move along this structure called the fallopian tube. And as it does so, as shown in the top part of the panel, it will begin to divide. And it divides from one single cell into two, two to four, and so on. And as it proceeds down that um, division cycle, it also moves along the fallopian tube to the uterus, where it will eventually embed itself on the, on the uterine wall. And I deliberately turned this picture to show you the embryo landing on the uh, wall of the uterus. The embryo is shown in the top here, the ball of cells, as it develops, because it's analogous, really, to the lunar module leaving a spacecraft and crashing on the uh, lunar surface, that it lands there and begins to invade that um, tissue and begin to develop further as an embryo and something that we would recognize in human form. And as you notice, this structure goes from a little ball of cells, and then eventually it forms a little uh, cavity in a ball of cells at one end of the embryo. And those cells, uh, I'll tell you about, they're called the inner cell mass. And these are pictures of normal human embryos, real pictures. On the left is a two-cell embryo just after the egg was fertilized and the nucleus from the sperm and the egg combined and then the cell divided. Four cell, eight cell, and then it will develop into a much larger ball of cells uh, that are all compacted together, and that's called a morula. And then it will form a cavity 
in one part of it, and there's a little ball of cells at the top, and then other cells around the outside. And these are the first signs of what we call differentiation in the embryo. And that's really a very simple term. It just means that the cells have become different from each other. And in the right-hand part of the picture, there's some diagrams of that. The outer cells are what's called a trophoblast. Those are the cells that when the embryo lands on the uterine wall, on the lunar surface, they integrate into the lunar surface and dig in and hold the embryo fast there and allow further development. And the little ball of cells up here, which we call the inner cell mass, those cells will give rise to all the tissues in our body. Brain, heart, liver, lungs, everything come from that set of cells. And we call those cells pluripotent, which means pluri, many, and potent power. So they're able to give rise to many cell types. And then this is a little picture of the embryo after it's implanted. And what happens is that ball of cells flattens out and forms a flat plate of cells. And it's from that plate of cells that we develop. It occurs about two weeks after fertilization. And what happens is that the embryo begins to form a head end and a tail end, a left side and a right side. And that's very important because that's the first sign of true differentiation in the embryo when the, cell, the cells of the embryo begin to form specialized cell parts. At one end of the embryo will be the developing brain, at the other end the developing tail. We don't have one, but that's where it would be if we did. And the left side and the right side. And of course you can imagine that's very important to organize that properly. It's the most important part of development because if it happens badly, you can end up with a um, person with their head in the wrong place. You've heard of people saying, well, he's got his head up his... Uh, um, and um, that's because he didn't uh, develop correctly. So just to summarize, this pool of cells is called the inner cell mass. It's a group of cells that we call pluripotent. And that's just highlighted in these images here. So to cut a long story short, people realized these little ball of cells was um, uh, 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 what we call pluripotent. And people decided they would try and grow them in the laboratory. And so what they did was they took embryos that were discarded by in vitro fertilization clinics. And um, those are embryos that patients who've gone to an in vitro fertilization clinic have extra embryos in the freezer, and at some point they're asked, what do you want to do with them? And they can either throw them away, give them to someone else, or donate them to research. And I'm just curious to do a little survey. How many of, them, how many of you in that situation would want to throw them away, to discard them? Maybe one or two people. Um, how many people would want to donate the embryos to another couple? And how many people would donate them for research? So it turns out that's the, about the same number as um, in national polls of couples. And the interesting thing is that they tend not to want to necessarily give them as much to other couples, perhaps because they have some connection with that embryo and they think it's like giving a child away. But more people in general want to give the embryos for research, and so researchers can use them. They isolated the embryos, they isolated the inner cell mass, they put it into culture on a layer of what we call feeder cells, which are just fibroblasts that grow there and provide um, goodies that keep the uh, stem cells alive. And eventually those stem cells begin to divide, and they grow and they fill the petri dish, and you can take them out and put them in a new petri dish, they'll fill that up, and they'll expand indefinitely. And so we have cells in the freezer back from the 1990s in mouse cells, back from the 1980s when we first developed um, embryonic stem cells. And those cells have incredible properties. On the left is a little panel of some stem cells. We've stained the stem cells with the red dye. And in the top left-hand panel, you see the stem cells when we first put them into culture. There are only one or two of them. 
And then gradually over about the space of a week, an individual cell will grow to form this um, large colony of cells. And we can split those cells up, put them back into single cells, and they'll do the same thing over and over again. So we can grow them indefinitely and in massive numbers. And in comparison to a lot of cell types that we grow in the lab, they also have a normal genotype. A lot of cancer cells have abnormalities where they've duplicated chromosomes or deleted chromosomes. If we grow these cells properly, they have an absolutely normal human genotype, just like you and I. So the great thing about that is that for all the things we want to do in the lab and in the clinic, they're identical to our cells. They're not abnormal tumor cells. And then finally, we can test them for what we call pluripotency. And we find that in those assays, they give rise to every cell type present in the human body. So those cells have two remarkable qualities. They can be expanded um, indefinitely, and they can give rise to every cell type. And because of that, the combination of those two properties, they provide essentially an infinite resource for replacing any cell type present in our bodies. So here are some of the cell types that we've made in the labs here. Um, on the bottom right are some oligodendrocytes that are the cells that wrap the nerve cells in the brain. Uh, the top left, I think, are uh, neurons in green. The bottom left are skeletal muscle cells that make up the muscles of our bodies and so on. And because these cells can make every cell type in the body, theoretically they could be used to treat a wide variety of diseases from Alzheimer's to spinal cord injury and stroke. Virtually anything that we can imagine to study in the lab can be done with these cells, and virtually any disease that we want to treat could be theoretically treated with these cells. So, all sounds very good so far. The question is, is it all a bed of roses? And to tell you about that, my colleague Sid Golub will This is Sid. <laughs> you cannot get away with that. <laughs> so I would like to introduce then Dr. Sid Golub. Thank you, Peter. Um, who is, uh, I don't know, emeriti of everything. So he is an emeritus director here. He was the second director for the Stem Cell Research Center here. He's also a former provost at UCI, former dean of the UCL, UCLA um, School of Medicine, and has been a phenomenal mentor. Sid. Thank you. I, you convinced everybody I <clears throat> can't hold a job. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> so so uh, thank you, uh, Eileen, and thank you, Peter, for, for getting us started here. Uh, Peter and I are going to take on three topics, and this is the biggest one, and the others will be shorter. We're not going to try to cover every ethical issue or every uh, important piece of history. Uh, the, uh, so is it a bed of roses? Well, not to everybody. Here we are with uh, some of the protests that we get in the stem cell field. And it's an interesting problem because we get protests from both sides. Uh, in the lower uh, corner here on the left uh, is uh, somebody who doesn't believe that we should be doing any stem cell research. And uh, a protest in Washington, D.C. urging us to stop. The other is a protest in Rome, Italy, demanding access to those stem cells for clinical treatment. Uh, and I won't go through all the reasons why it was denied in, the, in there. It had to, had to actually do with uh, safety considerations, but patients were demanding access and having protests. I find it interesting that protests in Italy are done in English with Italian subtitles. <laughs> I had not expected that. Uh, so, Peter described <laughs> Uh, the discoveries that led to, to dealing with this uh, structure, the, the blastocyst, the early embryo uh, that uh, are often discarded from uh, in vitro fertilization clinics. And the protests had to do with the fact that uh, people have different views of what the moral status of this structure is. 100 to 150 cells, no organs, no sensory organs, it can't feel, it can't hear, it can't feel pain. Uh, 
I uh, can't see anything, it has no limbs, it's just got those trophoblasts and the inner cell mass. People often ask the question, so when does life begin for, are these live, is this a life? Uh, when does life begin is a tricky question to answer, it depends on context, scientists like to immediately answer four billion years ago, uh, in, a, in a primordial ooze someplace in an ocean. That's generally an unsatisfying answer. So uh, then uh, we could say, well, how about humans? When did we start? A couple hundred thousand years ago, maybe 350,000 years ago. Also not a particularly gratifying answer. So when did we start as a potential life for lives? Well, clearly at fertilization. But I put the plural in there because the structures that Peter was showing the early ones are not one potential life, they're multiple potential lives. If they divide early, you can get monozygotic or identical twins, you get identical triplets. So was that one life or two lives or three lives? Sometimes a little later on, about the time that they implant in the, in the uterus, uh, they, they can no longer do that trick of becoming more than one individual and they're and they're set as a single individual the theologians want to ask it the question as to when at what point does a soul enter this this is not a scientific question and it's not an easy one for the theologians either so we're going to try to get at the question but i first want to just lay a few principles about bioethics that we're going to deal with in, in this country, the foundational document of our bioethic principles is called the Belmont Report. It came in the 1970s at a time when we had done some really terrible things in medical research, and I'm not going to go into its ugly history. That's a different lecture I give someone. Um, but we evolved this uh, set of principles that have guided us since. And there's three major principles. One is to have respect for the research subject. These are autonomous people. They can make their own choices. You can't decide for somebody else that they ought to be a research subject. Only the, that individual can make that decision. It ought to be for some good purpose. And finally, it ought to be fair. You can't ask one group of people to take all the risks for the rest of us. So these are the basic principles that bioethics rests on. There are philosophical bases for them, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into a moral philosophy lecture here. Let's just say that, that two of them that are important to fields of, uh, of inquiry are um, utilitarianism, which is a, arose in the 18th century in, in England, and it's a very common and fundamental to, to bioethical thought. And it's easily summarized as, or it's inaccurately and incompletely summarized, but usefully summarized as the greatest good for the greatest number. It's, it goes to the consequences. What's the outcome? If the outcome was really good, it must have been moral. If the outcome makes people happy and saves lives, it must be moral. The alternative way of thinking about it is called the ontology. Uh, I don't know if anybody has ever seen the, uh, the uh, sitcom on television called The Good Place. Anybody know this one? People, yeah? All right. the, the ethicist in that, Chidi, is a deontologist. Um, it's a wonderful show for those who haven't seen it. Uh, it's great fun, as well as having some good ethics in it, good ethics teaching lessons, but it's mostly fun. Um, anyway, in deontology, you, uh, you set out a set of rules of, of, in advance. You say, these are the things I believe in, and I'm not going to compromise them for some immediate need. And uh, summarized nicely, I thought, by this quote from Kant, uh, Immanuel Kant, the founder of this field, always recognized that human individuals are ends, 
and not means to your end. That is, they're not there, we're not there for somebody else to use. We're there for our own purposes. Uh, some deontologists would expand these rights, this approach, to embryos, and that's rather controversial. Uh, so, in fact, uh, the head of the uh, National Bioethics Commission during the uh, George W. Bush administration was a very prominent deontologist who felt the embryo had all the same rights as an adult. Most people find, have find it difficult to, to make that extrapolation. So it's not going to be solved by philosophers. Uh, and so uh, we have to agree that the that the, the most entangling issues are political and religious. One thing I'm not is a theologian, so I'll be very quick in summarizing here uh, and pointing out that we're not going to get a clean answer from religion either, because it depends very much what a religion you look at. Uh, many religions find the use of human embryonic cells for to make stem cells, which causes the destruction of a of a uh, an embryo, uh, morally acceptable, and some do not. Prominent among the religions that do not uh, feel comfortable with that is Roman Catholicism, although that's fairly recent in historic terms. Came about in 1869 with Pope Pius IX. Before that, the teachings were were focused on uh, the medieval uh, scholar uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas, who talked about kind of the evolution of a soul, and thought that the first weeks or months of a of a pregnancy were a different kind of nature than the later months, and he actually talked about a soul of water, a soul of vegetable matter, and an animal soul. And that was a, a Catholic dogma until Pope Pius IX uh, was introduced to a new medical instrument by the uh, Vatican physician. The medical instrument with a stethoscope, and he, he put the stethoscope to the uh, to the belly of a pregnant woman and heard a fetal heartbeat and was very deeply moved by this. And what he said was something that we kind of lose track of since. In his writing about it and the, the papal doctrine that he, he came out with afterwards was we can't, we, I learned about this from the new technology that, that had not been informing us before that. Other technologies will come that will inform us, but it won't tell us when the soul enters. It's unknowable. And so I think it's best, said the Pope, to, to uh, um, err on the side of safety and just assume that as soon as you can call it an individual at fertilization, that that is the appropriate time to give it protection because we can't know when it has a soul. Uh, that came down to be, you see how the protesters said, life begins at fertilization. It's not actually what the dogma was at the time. It was, it was more nuanced than that. Evangelical Protestantism has taken this up from a very different viewpoint. They, they, because they're Protestants, they don't listen to the Pope. Um, so uh, it's based on biblical text. You won't be surprised to learn that the Bible does not mention stem cells. Uh, it's, it's a little early for that kind of discussion. Um, but it does talk about, about fetal life, or at least preborn life, in, some, in a few places. And, and those have been seized upon to, to justify the belief that, that no unborn uh, should that all unborn should have protection. This is not the view of many other religions. The uh, other major uh, monotheistic religions are comfortable with stem cell technology and 
using embryonic stem cells, uh, as well as all, almost all the Eastern religions. But the, uh, the uh, 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 we should not use stem cell, uh, use embryos to gain stem cells, gain some traction politically. And for a period of time, we were unable to use stem cells. Uh, this was uh, during the George W. Bush administration, and this cartoon illustrates the view that uh, stem cell science was being hamstrung uh, by, by those restrictions. In fact, this is all an interesting discussion, and it's become, to some degree, largely irrelevant. And it's become irrelevant for two reasons. One was uh, after the Bush administration, President Obama changed the policy, and we went from less than two dozen stem cell-derived cell lines to study to about 400. And that gave us the opportunity to study a whole variety of cells, and there's probably relatively little need to make new derivations of embryonic stem cells. Uh, there's also a lot available from other sources. There are stem cell banks and registries in Canada, United Kingdom, Europe, other places. And finally, a new technology was introduced which revolutionized the stem cell field. And it's called uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, and I'm going to turn it over to our scientists to tell you more about that. We'll take a bunch of questions at the end, okay? So as Sid mentioned, the controversy over embryonic stem cells was to some extent alleviated by the development of this new technology called induced pluripotent stem cells. I'm going to play for you now a little um, video that um, comes from a, a scientist in Japan who had an ethical problem with using embryos uh, to destroy them to make stem cells. From ESL's embryonic stem cells, we can make all the cells that exist in our body. However, we have to uh, destroy embryos in order to uh, generate uh, ES cells. This scientist had two children, and he thought of destroying embryos as if he might have at some point even destroyed his own uh, children. And he was very troubled by that. So he began to work on a method of making stem cells that didn't require the destruction of embryos. I told you earlier about the development of the embryo after implantation, where it forms this flat plate called the epiblast, and differentiated cells begin to form at that time. And um, it was realized then that those cells were pluripotent, that they could make everything. And I'm going to represent those cells uh, in this cartoon and explain to you the thinking behind Shinya Yamanaka's um, uh, science. All of the cells in our body, with a few exceptions, contain exactly the same genetic information encoded in our DNA. So they're all the same, but we have brain cells that look very different to the liver cells, to heart cells, to skin cells. So how do they accomplish that? Well, you can think of the um, genes encoded in the DNA and the proteins they make as little Lego blocks. They can be assembled in lots of different ways. So all of these cells have the same set of genes, but whether they use all of those genes determines what type of cell they'll make. So when he looked at different cells, a stem cell, let's say a neuron, or a fibroblast, which is a skin cell uh, that provides connection between the tissues, and you look at the genes that are switched on, in one cell there'll be a set of genes switched on that are off in another cell, and vice versa. So Yamanaka made this um, hypothesis. What if you could take 
the genes that are on in a stem cell and switch them on in a fibroblast? What would that do to that cell? And so he did that experiment. We'll discard the neuron for now. Um, he switched the stem cell genes on in the fibroblast, and it turned into a stem cell. So now, for the very first time, you could take a normal cell that you might discard in any case d during your life, or any cell from other parts of the body that weren't making an embryo, and you could turn it into a stem cell that was just like a stem cell derived from an embryo. And he did that by taking the skin cells, taking the genes that um, in, were switched on in a stem cell, he put them into a little virus, he infected the fibroblasts, and after a few days, those cells turned into stem cells that would grow and divide and proliferate and expand and fill the whole dish and do it over and over and over again. Here are some pictures from our labs of those cells that he called human-induced pluripotent stem cells because they were induced by expressing the genes in them. On the left are human-induced pluripotent stem cells, and on the right, human embryonic stem cells. I've only shown you one image of them, but there are lots of other analyses that I could show you that these cells, the induced pluripotent stem cells or iPS cells, are almost identical to human ES cells. They're equivalent but not equal, and some of the reasons for that are rather technical, but for all intents and purposes, induced pluripotent stem cells could now be used in the same way that embryonic stem cells could be used. That experiment won Shinya Yamanaka the Nobel Prize, and honestly, that technology, because it was so simple, spread throughout the scientific community around the world, and has transformed not only the potential treatments of human disease, but the way we study it. Because not only can we make those cells from normal individuals, we can make them from patients with Alzheimer's disease or Huntington's disease or diabetes and study the disease in a dish. So what's the problem? Thank you. Right. Uh, if something can go wrong, it will. Uh, although we haven't gone too far wrong yet with the iPS cells. But there are some issues that we're going to have to address. I do want to point out one thing. Uh, th there's no question that iPS cells revolutionized the stem cell field. But Yamanaka would not have known what genes to change if we hadn't had embryonic stem cells. He had to go back to that resource to understand what to change to get to iPS cells. So what could go wrong here? Well, one thing to consider is if you can make anything out of stem cells, stem cells can make any tissue, any cell type, you can make a rather interesting and potentially complicated one. You can make gametes. That is, you can make from iPS cells I can figure out how to do this thing. Oops. You, you can make sperm and you can make eggs. It's all right. I'm, I'm good here. Thank you. Um, now, you wouldn't make them from the same, same Petri dish. You'd do it from two different donors. But that means a possibility of true asexual reproduction. And this is a really interesting idea. But can you make something useful out of it? Can you really do it? Well, one attempt that's ongoing right at the moment is an attempt to use this approach to save a, an endangered species, the northern white rhino. The northern white rhinoceros, at the time this, uh, this diagram was made, 2016, there were three left on the planet. There's now two, the male. Uh, on the right, there it has died, so there are two uh, middle-aged female rhinos of the northern white rhino species. To, to, uh, to maintain this species, there's an attempt ongoing 
to produce induced, from induced pluripotent stem cells oocytes, because they've got stored sperm from the male and from other, other uh, male rhinos uh, before the species died out, and do IVF with those IPS-derived gametes, sperm and egg, and then find a surrogate. This is a picture I took of a southern white rhino. Uh, I, I, when I was taking the picture, I thought of how would you ask her, her permission? Uh, <laughs> carefully is certainly the, uh, she's a rather formidable lady, but uh, she could be these closely related species. She could be the sur uh, surrogate for that northern white rhino. One thing I'd point out that the northern white rhino and the southern white rhino aren't white, they're gray. They're battleship gray. That's a misnomer. That's got an interesting history that I won't go into. So that's a great idea. We can start saving some endangered species with it. But how about our species? Um, this is a book that came out from a uh, eminent bioethicist, uh, scholar at Stanford University, Hank Greeley, uh, and he called it The End of Sex, uh, a intentionally provocative title. Uh, and he envisioned a future in which we would have reproduction of our species by using these gene editing advances, such as CRISPR, to take cells, clean them up, get rid of the genes we don't want, like disease-causing genes or susceptibility genes, maybe enhance them if we wanted to with, by addition of genes or regulation of genes, then use those cells to generate iPS cells, stem cells which, from which we could derive sperm and egg, use those to do IVF, put it in a surrogate, and out comes a disease-resistant designer offspring. Science fiction? Not really. Most of the technology's in place. It's close enough that we have to seriously think about what are the implications of our capacity now to make gametes, sperm and egg, by stem cell technology. It's going to have some interesting and gratifying uses, like saving endangered species, but it may also have some dangerous ones. We don't have an answer to this one now, but we're going to have to think it through and decide what are we going to allow, what are we going to not allow. Peter, our last topic. So, we can make pluripotent stem cells. What can we do with them? We could potentially treat a wide variety of diseases because if you understand that you've got a pluripotent cell that can make everything, theoretically you can make any cell type in the body in massive numbers to replace those damaged by disease or injury. So we can do a number of things with those. That process of development in a dish actually gives us an insight into the development of our own species. Up until now, we've normally studied it in frogs and mice and so on, but they aren't us. And so there's enormous utility in understanding normal development using normal human cells. Because we can make normal human cells, we might also be able to use those to do drug screening. Why does a drug affect some cells in the heart of some people and not in others. And we could begin to understand that again in a much better way. And up until now, drug companies have tended to use rats for drug testing. And again, rats aren't us. So it explains why some drugs look promising in the preclinical trials, but when they go to clinical trials, they don't work, or in some cases can be very damaging to the individual. And then the final thing that really has captured the major attention of 
the public is the ability to use stem cell derived cells to treat a wide variety of diseases. This is the layman's view that um, as we get older, we might all need a top up of stem cells into our brain that would really help us um, to do that crossword or you know, remember where we put our keys. Um, but I'm gonna show you some experiments now where some mice were given a, a small spinal cord injury and then they were either given uh, a control treatment or a stem cell transplant. And these are some of the experiments that really excited the public about the use of, of stem cells. And I should say that these are not pluripotent stem cells. This is a type of what we call multipotent stem cell, called a neural stem cell, that comes from a part of the brain. But the similar concept is to with pluripotent stem cells. So this animal um, received a spinal cord um, damage to part of its spine. It drags its um, hind feet behind it. And as you watch the video go, you'll see that the animal um, drags its hind legs along behind it. And you see uh, its hind leg is dragging it behind because it isn't getting the right signals from the brain to the muscle or back again to tell it to move that um, leg. And here now, and these um, studies, by the way, were carried out here at UC Irvine by Eileen Anderson, who introduced the whole program, and Professor Brian Cummings. And this animal now received a transplant of neural stem cells, and this animal does a much better job. It's now lifted its hind limb underneath itself and pushes off most of the time fairly well. And it's experiments like these that really excited the general public about the utility of stem cells to um, treat human disease. But as usual, with this advance in technology, there are ethical issues that come along with it. Thank you. Well, there's a variety of ethical issues when we get to actually using stem cells in patients. Uh, there's, we have, a, have to have a kind of new risk-benefit analysis because we're dealing with issues that we hadn't dealt with before. Uh, for example, many of the diseases that have been initially treated are very rare diseases. Are we asking only people with these very rare diseases to be our, take the risk for all of us? There's a reason we go to those rare diseases. There's no treatments available for them. Stem cells offer something that's unavailable otherwise. But it also means that we're asking often children with, with these rare, difficult diseases to take the risk for the rest of us. There's questions of informed consent. How much do you need to tell the patient, the subject of the research, about where the cells came from, how we grew them, how they've been tested, and so on. We had a whole conference on this topic because it's a complicated one, it's not an easy one, and it poses new issues. There's also that question of justice that I mentioned in the Belmont report. How are we going to distribute these fairly? It's likely, initially, that this is going to be very expensive. When, when uh, stem cell, when uh, bone marrow transplants arrived on the scene in the 1970s, the average bone marrow transplant in the 1970s was cost about a quarter million dollars. In today's dollars, that's stupendous. It's a couple million dollars per patient. We're going to be facing some of those kinds of initial costs. It came down eventually with, with bone marrow transplants as we learn ways to, to, to do it better. But there's going to be some very tricky questions about how do we distribute this, these new therapies that are going to be complicated and expensive. Some people are not going to want to touch them. And that's, that's going to make a kind of division in our society, uh, particularly if we're using fetal or embryonic stem cells. And perhaps most acutely that we're dealing with now, 
There's unreasonable expectations and a lot of hype about what's going on. Let me give you an example of the ultimate hype, I believe. Oh, I'll get to it in a moment. I'm sorry, I had it out of order. Uh, when we do studies here, we try to have, we have a three-layered safeguards for the subject. We have uh, the Food and Drug Administration, which has rigorous guidelines, and all the trials we do at UCI have to go through FDA approval, which is not easy to obtain. Secondly, we have a, sec a, uh, a specialized committee on stem cell oversight to examine the cells, to know what the cell biology is, the safety of using them, and the provenance, the history of those cells. Where did they come from? Were they obtained by ethical means, and so on. And finally, what's called the Institutional Review Board reviews the informed consent issues, the safety, the overall project to make sure that it's safe. So we've got this three-layered review for our trials. Something that doesn't have review process is this. The first ever bra that causes stem cells to home to a woman's breast to enlarge their size. Available on the internet. Uh, we're selling them to support the stem cell center. Uh, uh, that's typical of a whole variety of less scientifically grounded therapies on the marketplace right now. This is a very important paper that came out in 2016 by Lee Turner in Minnesota and, uh, and Paul Knopfler at UC Davis, examining uh, cell, stem cell tourism in the United States. Stem cell tourism used to be something where people went to Malaysia or India or, or Ukraine, actually had a number of stem cell clinics. Uh, or Ecuador, or places which had not as strict safety requirements. Uh, now you can get stem cells throughout the United States from un FDA unapproved uh, centers. You can see there's a, a, a group in Florida, a large cluster, and a very large cluster in Southern California. I'll give you an ad that I saw in an airplane magazine flying back to uh, Orange County from San Francisco on Alaska Airlines. I've, I'm not going to give them any uh, free publicity, so I've blacked out the... <laughs> um, and uh, offering stem cells from your own body to treat, look at the list of diseases, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. There's, there is no approved stem cell therapy for this. Arthritis, Parkinson's, stroke, traumatic brain injury. We're working on all these diseases. There are no FDA approved treatments for these diseases. Uh, it's, I put an arrow at the bottom because for various legal reasons, this clinic now puts out a disclaimer that, saying these therapies have not been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration. This is their response to the various lawsuits that they've gotten. So um, my view of the world is that uh, I, uh, the scientists find it harder and harder getting work done because of the ethicists hanging around. I hope so. Uh, but at least that we, we ask, keep asking the right questions about what we're doing. Peter will summarize it for you, and we'll take a few questions. So we'd like to add by telling you a little bit about what's going on in California, because I think for Californians, this is something to be very proud of. The California Stem Cell Agency was uh, formed in 2004 after a proposition was placed on the um, California election, and it was passed into law. And CIRM uh, committed $3 billion, the state committed $3 billion to set up this organization called the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. And they've supported research in this building, they've supported the construction of this building so that we could do stem cell research without running afoul of the um, federal law. 
And one of the things I think is really important for you to know is that because of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, 56 clinical trials have been developed based on research going on in California, research that will be approved and has been approved by the FDA to go to that uh, trial and for a wide variety of uh, diseases. So there's enormous hope there for families suffering from a wide variety of uh, ailments. And this is just a, a slide from CIRM that lists some of the uh, diseases and disorders that are currently being um, tested in clinical trial for the ability of stem cells to ameliorate those diseases. So um, we'll end there and be happy to answer questions, but um, I'd like to reiterate something Eileen said at the beginning. We're glad you came. There are three things that you could do. One is learn about stem cells because there's a lot of misinformation out there, particularly as Sid said about fake uh, stem cell transplants out there. Supporting the work is tremendously important to us. As Eileen said, small amounts of dollars, we can leverage them into um, enormous opportunities of funding. And finally, particularly for the uh, kids out there, write to your representatives, tell them that this work is important, ask them to support it. Thank you. Happy to take questions. I had a question about the rhinos. So, yes. um, when it's you, fascinating. I love they are really story. fascinating. So, when you insert the um, embryo, is that since it's like a different, I guess, part of the species, would it be like analogous to inserting like an embryo of like African descent into someone who's like European? Uh, no, these are different species, and so so a, a, a northern white rhino and a southern white rhino can't mate. And there, it's not like uh, just differences in body shape or something like that. They're 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 genetically close, but not identical. It's more like us and a chimpanzee. Uh, probably a little bit closer than that, but we're very close to chimpanzees. But it's not quite close enough to, to allow productive mating between the two, so that's why they're separate species. So, would any of the traits that are unique to the southern white rhino be in that embryo, or would it be identical to like a normal Northern rhino? It will be a northern white rhino. The question was if they created this way through the IPS cells, and, and the surrogate mom is a southern white rhino. Will it have any southern white rhino traits? Perhaps a few by, by what we call epigenetics, but it would largely be, it would be a northern white rhino. Okay. You get another. Hello, uh, thanks so much for coming to talk about this. And then uh, I just had a question, like, um, like what kind of research are you guys working right now? Like what's like the present day like thing for like stem cells? Dr. Anderson, you want to? Well, uh, in this building, we have 26 labs here, more than 50 labs across campus. And there are people here who work on uh, getting gametes from stem cells on neurological diseases like stroke and spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, on uh, diseases like cancer and cancer stem cells and how to either target those cells or understand better what they do because there's a stem cell population that's very important there, on uh, wound healing and skin stem cells, on diabetes and stem cells that are involved that could be used as a replacement therapy for the cells that you lose in diabetes or other immune disease. Vision diseases. Vision diseases, including retinite pigmentosa and macular degeneration, and using stem cells as replacement therapies, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, for any of you who saw or participated in the tours earlier, quite, quite a range. That's the wonderful thing about stem cells, is you can go after almost any disease issue because of their great flexibility. Yes. Hi, I actually have two questions. The first one is uh, scientific, I guess. The second one is ethics. The first one is when you use IPS, 
uh, I believe you can take it from your own body, right? And then you can create a, uh, create a gamut out of your own body. Eventually, you're basically clone yourself, right? You can clone a person that way. Is that true? The second question is, if that's true, um, what about the person you clone? Are they, I mean, I don't know, do they, <laughs> do, do they, um, do they consider it like your continuation? I'm not sure, like, what's the ethical? So I'll address the science and then we'll let Sid address the ethics. Because that answer will be fun to hear. Um, <laughs> so, um, theoretically now, um, we could make, um, we could take skin cells from you and turn them into um, eggs. And we could take, for example, a skin cell from me and turn them into sperm. But that's only half of what you need to make an individual. How about turning the skin cell from me and making both the sperm and the egg to, that's what I mean by clone. Yeah, so um, you're um, a woman and you have two X chromosomes. And in order to make sperm, you need the genes on the Y chromosome, none of which you have. Uh, yeah. So um, again, theoretically, we could take your egg and we could activate it and um, make what's called a parthenote. And that perhaps could develop normally, but typically not. So we couldn't exactly clone you very easily by that method from iPS cells. There is another way to do it, but we didn't talk about it tonight. So if you don't mind, we won't talk about it now. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not real anxious to talk about the ethics of cloning. <laughs> it's a big, uh, complicated issue that's been blown up, I think, more than it deserves. Uh, there was a National uh, Academy of Sciences sponsored meeting about cloning in 2002, I think way back when, and they came to the conclusion that we don't need to rush into this. Uh, we might want to come back and look at it sometime in the future if the technology improves, but right now it's cloning a human would be dangerous, likely to fail, and not worth the effort. And I, I'm happy to leave it there because I concur on all those. Okay. Oh, I just was wondering about like on the topic of cloning and such. I remember learning that like sometimes a clone isn't really like an exact clone of the original because like sometimes the DNA degrades. When you like turn an adult like specialized cell into like a gamete, do you also face the same hurdles of like, oh, like DNA might be already like tampered with or destroyed, so that might affect the outcome? So um, during the process of cloning, you take a um, nucleus containing the genetic information from what we call a somatic cell from your body, which is any of the cells of your body except for cells of the germline that make gametes. You, you take that cell, you isolate the nucleus from it, and then you put it into the cytoplasm of an egg. And then you electrically activate the egg, the nucleus begins to divide and it produces a clone. The genetic information doesn't uh, get altered at all usually, um, but the Genetic information has surrounding it proteins that regulate its activity, and that process is known as epigenetics. So in the transfer process, um, and in the cell culture systems, you can change the epigenetics of the nucleus without changing the genetics of it at all. And it's the epigenetics that tends to make uh, so-called clones um, usually unhealthy and abnormal. When that um, uh, experiment was first done in mice, the clones ended up being very obese. And that's why I think most scientists concur with what uh, Dr. Golub just said, which is cloning in humans, even if you could do it, which is technically not uh, possible right now, even if you could do it, it would be a dangerous process, very bad for the individual that was produced, and probably not worth it. Hi, good evening. Thank you all, but thank you for coming out. Um, all of this research is very interesting and hope it all is very successful. Once we get beyond this though, what's the future with stem cell research? Uh, 
uh, scientifically and then politically or ethically, what will it take for us as a society or the race to get there? Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great question. Uh, I'll, I'll speculate on what's next in, in, in science, and Peter and Eileen and others may want to contribute. I think the next great hurdle is organs. We can build tissues from stem cells. Uh, I think the next challenge is not to build uh, uh, a sheet of retinal stem cells, but to build an eye. Or not to build some liver cells, but to build a liver. That's going to be very complex and challenging, uh, but if we really want to get to replacement of injured and damaged and diseased organs, we're going to have to get there. It'll take bioengineering, it'll take stem cell science, it will take creativity, money, and hard work. Uh, but I think we'll get there. Peter, you want to add anything? Before the building cuts us off. <laughs> um, Sid's absolutely right. That is one of the really exciting new frontiers in the stem cell space. But I would say that the stem cell field has an enormously long life potential because stem cells are essentially throughout our bodies uh, of different type, of different stem cells throughout our bodies, and they're responsible for repairing us all the time. And that science we've only just begun to understand. And the, the um, science of reprogramming, others have tried to apply it in the individual so that, for example, with a patient with diabetes that loses a particular type of beta cell in the, in the uh, pancreas, it's, it's potentially possible now to introduce viruses into the pancreas of that individual and turn the other cells into beta cells and cure the diabetes. So there's so much about our own, the biology of our own species that we don't understand and so many possibilities. The stem cell field isn't going away for a long, long time. So I, I would just add slightly to Peter's answer there. So I, I very much agree with Sid. In fact, we're, we have a faculty search going on this fall that's in this area of organ and tissue engineering. Um, one of the things about stem cells that I think none of us really touched on tonight was is the idea that all of us have stem cells in our body right now that are contributing to your normal organ and tissue function. This is how you heal your skin, right? If you get a cut, if you get a burn, there's a stem cell pool that's resident at the bottom layer of your skin all the time. It gets activated, and that's what yields the repair, right? And that doesn't happen, for example, in spinal cord injury. It doesn't happen in Parkinson's disease. And so many of us came at the stem cell field from a kind of simplistic way early on to say, okay, if we can just figure out what cell goes bad, we can grow it up in a dish, and then we can transplant it and replace it, and things are gonna be at least better. Right? And that's true. We can get some improvements that way. But it's, a, it's an overly simplistic spot that we're at right now for cell transplantation. It would be a heck of a lot better understanding much more as we do now about our endogenous stem cells, the cells that are in our body all the time, if we could learn the basic science of how to activate them and control them and tell them when to differentiate and where to go and how to heal yourself. Right? So especially, I think, for neurological diseases and injuries, this is actually going to be um, sort of the next wave that's, that's breaking in terms of repair. Because we're not going to grow a brain in a dish and replace yours. Right? <laughs> we need another way to get at that. I just I actually will tackle your, attempt to tackle your question. And that is that, um, yeah, this table is going to collapse on me. Um, I thought it was far more fit than that. Um, <laughs> Just to give one example, I've been working for about 10 years, eight or, eight or 10 years on a neural stem cell therapy for traumatic brain injury. So, so far the state of California or the federal government has invested probably eight or nine million dollars in that program. And we're not done yet. And so if we're lucky, maybe another five or 10 million dollars, I'll be at the stage of doing a clinical trial with one stem cell line. So everybody hears about, well, you can take a skin cell from anyone in this room and turn it into a stem cell. Sure you can. And then 
10 million dollars later you could convert that into a therapy for you personally so you know a lot of billionaires might be able to do this but for the average person we don't have a solution yet to how how we can scale this up and how the fda can approve our approach in a universal way so that if i then take a cell from you i could create a product for you so there's there's a lot more a lot more distance to go uh, there's a question. Uh, couple of questions, actually. Uh, the, uh, during the discussion, you talked about embryos, uh, stem cells from embryos. Are those the same as a stem cell from an umbilical cord? No. Short answer. No. <laughs> um, How do you really feel? No. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really glad. The, I couldn't see where the question came from. There you are. <laughs> uh, it's an important question. We get it all the time. Be, uh, umbilical cord stem cells are very useful, but what they are useful for, in large measure, is making blood. That's what they're there for in the in the in the maternal baby relationship. They're there to to uh, create more blood cells, uh, and there may be a small number of other stem cells in there that could be used for other things. But there aren't many cells to begin with. And what the stem cell banks for umbilical cord stem cells are useful for is for people who have leukemia or serious forms of anemia that require a bone marrow transplant or other kinds of blood cell, tr stem cell transplants, what we call hematopoietic stem cells. And umbilical cord is not generalizable, it's not, uh, it's not pluripotent stem cells, it's largely blood-forming stem cells. Thank you. I won't ask my second one. Sorry, I'll come I jumped on yours. Um, in the slide presentation, you made kind of a point that the induced stem cells were different than the embryonic, but that they could do the same thing, or I'm not sure I, get what that fully means. Do you use them for the same things? Can they accomplish the same things? Or do you have to use the embryonic for some? So or this, the this gets back to uh, the question about epigenetics and, and cloning. Um, in the process of converting a, a fibroblast into a stem cell, you're basically asking that cell to um, convert its gene expression into a stem cell profile. And the fibroblast cell, as I mentioned, has a very different profile. Uh, and so 30,000 genes throughout our genome are controlled in those cells in different, different ways. So some are on, some are off. Um, so it's a very complex process going back to taking a cell that's marked in one way and turning it into another one. And it often doesn't happen entirely correctly. And so when people make induced pluripotent stem cells, they can often make everything. But one of the things that was noticed early on is that they have a memory of where they come from. So that skin cells tend to be very good at making, for example, muscle, uh, skin, and other connective tissues. But an iPS cell derived from blood is not so good at doing that, or not so good at making neurons. It can do it, but not very effectively. But it's very good at going back into blood. And so um, it has to do with epigenetics. Both the cell types are pluripotent. They often express the same proteins, but they aren't identical because the process of forming an embryonic stem cell is the natural process of reprogramming where somehow the egg and the sperm know what, exactly what to do to make those different cell types. And we've never recreated that properly in a dish. One, way we might be, one day we might be able to, but certainly not now. Well, I just want to make a comment. Uh, if people notice I had a crutch here, that's because the cartilage has gone out of my right hip. And uh, I was told, like, oh, they can inject stem cells and some blood products and it'll regenerate the cartilage. Well, I've done a lot of study in myself and I said, well, I might generate something right away, but it probably ain't going to be a last very long. Uh, my theory is that uh, the blood comes out of the ends of your bones along with the stem cells and produces new cartilage very, very slowly in your body. And if you get old like I am, 
you all of a sudden use what's up there and it's not building it up back fast enough. Now, they did a study in uh, Korea with uh, stem cells and microfracture where they put holes in the ends of the bone so it let the blood and stem cell products come through and they had a seven year success for that. So uh, uh, that's, that's just an observation. I don't know if there's anybody that can answer any of my questions here, but <laughs> that's... Well, I'll give it a go. And then, um, so uh, my son had a, um, a knee operation where they isolated um, stem cells from his blood and injected them into the knee while they did a cartilage repair. And the real notion of that type of transplant is that the hemopoietic stem cells are making proteins that stimulates the, the tissue to repair itself. And as it turns out, that mechanism of action where a transplanted stem cell makes a protein that helps the endogenous tissue repair itself is actually fairly common. We, we called it in the early days a nursing effect. And so almost certainly the stem cells are not making new cartilage, but they're helping your cartilage repair itself and maybe reducing inflammation. And the exciting thing about that for many of us and people in this building work on this is that it's very difficult to make cells that are all the same to consider transplanting them into people. But the growth factors that are produced by the cells, you could purify those and uh, probably dry them down and inject them into people and have that same curative effect. So we're moving from the stage of necessarily always needing the stem cell to understanding what the stem cell does, understanding the fundamental biology, and moving towards more of a pharmaceutical approach, which is much safer and much easier to replicate. Now, but if you do the, the microfracture where you let the blood come out, theoretically, if it's not coming out now and you let more come out, then you can perhaps therapeutic. Uh... I'm, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer that question. Yeah. Could we have one of the kids here ask a question? <laughs> Janice, you said that um, I just asked you, did you have your question ready? Go on then. Um, I had a question earlier in the presentation. You mentioned multipotent and pluripotent, and I wanted to know the difference between the two. Great question. So um, pluripotent is reserved, a term reserved for the early cells of the embryo that can make every cell type in the body. And then during uh, development, sometimes those cells make what we call a, another stem cell, like Sid talked about, a, a blood stem cell. And that stem cell can't make brain, it can't make heart, but it can make all the cell types of the blood, the lymphocytes, the leukocytes, the macrophages, the eosinophils and the mast cells, and the red blood cells. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he was already impressed. He's an immunologist, so he knows about the blood. Uh, so, um, but because that can make a lot of cell types, but it can't make everything, it's now called multipotent. It can make a lot of things, but it's not pluripotent. Peter, I'm back. No? Two back here. No? Well, how come you haven't got a question? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, my mom had a rather life-threatening uh, stem cell transplant, I think back in 95 at St. Joe's for breast cancer, um, because they had to use her own stem cells, and there was about 1% of cancer in those stem cells, which they had to use and give back to her. Um, I only know I've learned so much because I was with her every day, and it was pretty amazing to see. So how has that advanced is what my question is. Today. Yeah, I, I actually have some familiarity with, with this topic. The, the strategy there was to take uh, patients with cancer, particularly breast cancers, treat them with high, higher dose chemotherapy than is usual for the treatment, enough to theoretically kill all the cancer cells, but also it will knock out the bone marrow. So you take the bone marrow from that patient in advance uh, and store it, and when they need, after the chemotherapy, give them back their own bone marrow to restore their capacity to make blood. 
It was uh, theoretically very appealing. It had a period of a lot of use. It has faded away because it wasn't very effective. There are a lot of things that, that sound like they make sense, that logic tells us ought to work, and the body doesn't work that way. Um, so uh, that was a, there may still be some circumstances where that's appropriate, but as a general strategy for advanced breast cancer, it has, it has disappeared, or mostly disappeared. I, you, well, one could comment, though, that that's true in the case of cancer, but um, Grab a mic. Sorry, I can't do that. Um, it actually, as most clinical trials do, taught us something um, as a field, not, you know, like me, us. <laughs> um, and so autoimmune disease is an example where a variant of that has, has been applied. So um, as an example where your, your immune system is attacking itself, in the case of multiple sclerosis, it's attacking the myelin, the insulation around your, your neurons. Um, one way to think about treating that is to get rid of your immune cells and reset them to normal, right, that are doing that attacking. And so there's been a, a fair bit of success. There was a really nice paper published in JAMA at the very beginning of this year doing um, a myeloablative strategy, so taking away a sufficient radiation to ablate your bone marrow and then doing a bone marrow transplant back to reset that baseline, which has had tremendous potential in that clinical trial in terms of treating things like very severe autoimmune disease that's um, that's chronic and progressive. So one step forward, one step to the side, that's the... So 14 years later, she, uh, 14 years, I think it was 14 years, she was in remission, but she got stomach and colon cancer and passed away a month later, but the doctor's uh, oncologist said it was not related to the breast cancer, so I'm not sure because she had 19 it, positive lymph nodes, but it could have not been related. I don't know it, if that cancer yeah. was still in her. It, it's probably unlikely to be related, uh, those unusual sites for breast cancer to spread. Uh, but uh, as, as Dr. Anderson pointed out, uh, not all experiments work, but all experiments teach. Yeah. So, so uh, we, we learn from, from the ones that work, and we learn from the ones that don't work exactly as we expected. Uh, and uh, there's certainly many uses for hematopoietic stem cell transplants, of bone marrow transplants and other sources of, of hematopoietic. It just didn't work quite as well as we'd hoped in breast cancer, but if she went 14 years, it actually worked pretty well. Um, do you see anything that could go wrong with stem cells? Yes. <laughs> It's a great question. I, I, I don't want to be dismissive of it. Stem cells have their risks. Uh, they could de-differentiate into, in, they could become tumorous, and anything that grows, any cell type that grows, is already triggering parts of the biochemical cycle that make cells grow, and that includes cells that become cancerous. So there's some risk there. There's risk that they could differentiate into the wrong kind of cell. You know, what if you're trying to build a, a, a nerve cell for motor control and get a pain receptor out of it? So there are risks. We really, the, the answer to that is we don't just throw them at people. You test them out in animals, you test them out in vitro, you test them thoroughly to understand what those risks are before, before you start injecting them into people. Um, uh, since, um, since you referred before that we can help save endangered species, I wonder if it's also possible to, um, to like revive newly extinct species in that same way? I believe that um, there have been attempts to, to do that with the woolly mammoth, um, to uh, take what we know about the DNA of the woolly mammoth Put it into a modern elephant, and uh, but that really is the the stuff of science fiction and um, Jurassic Park. So we'll have to we'll have to wait on that one for a bit. But um, the, the the scientist who who has proposed the woolly mammoth 
followed Harvard by the name of George Church. He's also proposed uh, re reviving uh, the Neanderthal man. Uh, a, what? Well, his, his argument when asked why would we want to, his answer is to make our species more diverse. Come on. And, so a dear friend of mine suffers from chronic color blindness, and he has also has a lot of like allergies as well. I was wondering with the advancements of stem cell research, if you could see any possible cures in this department. Well, allergies, um, uh, probably more to do with the immune system, and I think that there are probably other treatments for that. In terms of color blindness, um, I don't know. Um, Send your friend to the lab, we'll work on it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for um, giving us such wonderful um, a lecture today. I was just wondering, because we talk about a lot of biology and medicine and cure and, uh, you know, like uh, all these matters. So I was wondering, how does uh, uh, this uh, technology help the, the STEM uh, research, like machine learning, you know, artificial intelligence and that kind of stuff? So is there any, uh, you know, research around that areas to help to, 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 uh, to develop the STEM? So. Well, I think uh, machine learning is going to impact a lot of biology um, because we can use it to uh, really understand the fundamental biological processes. And one of the rising trends in biology is the uh, analysis of very large data sets, which um, again will begin to be analyzed by uh, machine learning. And one of the major areas that it will probably um, impact is our understanding of the brain itself um, and how the brain perceives and interprets information. Of course, machine learning and artificial intelligence really grew out of our understanding of the brain, but I think it will be applied to that. In terms of actually the practicalities of the stem cell field, I think it will help us to understand things like epigenetics and gene control um, but that's at a very fundamental level, a much less practical level than a lot of what we've talked about tonight. Can you say something about ethics? Uh, I was recently asked to give a talk on stem cell ethics to a group of, of people studying uh, artificial intelligence. And I pointed out to them, because I didn't know much about it, the field, and I looked at what they were doing in the ethics field, and what was immediately apparent to me is that stem cells had come to grips with our ethical issues much more effectively than AI has or many of, of related fields. Uh, for example, we have accountability. We've got these three layers of, of oversight to determine when we're going to, to do something to an individual with the cell. We, we have a mechanism to, to review it, to determine what's appropriate to do. Um, the uh, AI field is a little bit of the Wild West. You know, it's whatever somebody wants to do, or very often whatever something some company wants to do uh, as, a, as a product. So I think that what we ought to be demanding from AI is real involvement in these other fields. It can be fabulously helpful, but also some greater accountability. Um, so so I have two questions. One's more science-y and one's more like bioethics. My first more science-y question is um, like how after replicating a lot of stem cells and having these really long, or these stem cell lines that last for a long time, how you prevent the like, DNA from degrading or like the telomeres from degrading to a point that is like dangerous. And then my more ethics question is um, not just like beyond stem cell therapy like to cure diseases, um, human enhancement, and what, what your opinion is on if human enhancement would be considered like good purpose with the Belmont report or not? So um, embryonic stem cells have a somewhat unique property that's shared with cells of the germline, but not with our 
the rest of the cells of the body in that they have a mechanism for extending the telomeres at the end of their chromosomes. And that um, means that they don't tend to undergo the type of genetic damage that other somatic cells do, because every time they divide, they will contract their telomeres, and that can lead to uh, uh, chromosomes sticking to each other and uh, causing crossovers and duplications and replications and so on. So stem cells themselves tend to be protected from the effects of DNA damage. That being said, when you grow them in the uh, culture disk in the lab, if you don't grow them correctly, they tend to be exposed to um, selective processes that can cause them to undergo genetic damage and that then selects for a cell that can survive in those conditions. And so uh, one of the problems, for example, in the lab is that if the students, because let's face it, the faculty aren't doing it, if the students um, don't look after the cells properly and maybe forget to come in early in the morning on Saturday to feed the cells and the cells have to grow for a little bit longer, those cells are then put under nutrient pressure where they're running out of nutrients and they have to survive. And that tends to select for abnormal cells uh, that then can take over the dish. So we have to look after the cells really, really carefully to avoid that, that type of thing. So in terms of that, there, there are mechanisms of cell to avoid DNA damage, and part of it is the way we uh, grow the cells. And um, just to say, um, one of the things that probably stem cells do is they go to bed at night and they repair themselves. So circadian rhythms are really important for stem cells, so I think we should all get to bed. Yeah. <laughs> one, one more question. Is it the ethics party? Yeah, uh, the, the, the question of enhancements is a really interesting one. It's already being dealt with or confronted. Um, there was a recent poll on it, and I thought actually uh, group wisdom was, was on target on it personally. That is, I agreed with it. Uh, when polled, many, people are perfectly comfortable a high proportion of people are comfortable with using gene alteration to, to prevent disease or to treat disease. And a very low proportion are comfortable using it to just change appearance. You know, what is better about being, let's say, blue-eyed or six feet tall, like some freaks are? Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, so, so uh, and, and what constitutes an enhancement? And all, all these things have some risk. And would you un undertake risk in order to change eye color? I mean, some of this has to be just thought through before one charges into it. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm leery of the use of any of these new technologies strictly for enhancement of, uh, of um, cosmetic traits. If the enhancement saves a life, I'm all in favor of it. All right, last question from a very patient person. Um, okay, so I know we were discussing the differences between pluripotent and multipotent stem cells, and we discussed how multipotent stem cells, for example, can like essentially generate like different kinds of like blood cells. So I was curious on how this would impact the field of like infectious diseases and immunology, because couldn't you basically use stem cells to like create like CD4 and like T cells and like inject them into a person who has AIDS? You could essentially like hold off their symptoms. So um, that's a that's a terrific question and a, a rather deep question. Um, the blood or hemopoietic stem cell that gives rise to all the cells of the blood indeed contributes to making um, uh, cells of the immune system that fight off infection. One of the ways that people um, can treat um, autoimmune diseases where the body attacks itself is to actually replace the whole of the blood system with uh, a, a blood system from a matched donor that doesn't have that um, immunological reactivity. But theoretically, you could take out the blood stem cell and in the culture dish, turn it into um, uh, immune cells. And certainly that is capable to some extent, but 
the, the stem cells in our bodies, the, what we call somatic stem cells, they have one fatal flaw. Um, and that is, I mean, they're very good at making other cells. Um, but when they divide, they divide by a mechanism called asymmetric cell division, where one of the stem cells has to remain there to re remain a stem cell. And it, one of the daughter cells moves out into the blood system and begins to form, let's say, uh, T cells. And um, that uh, method of replication is good for maintaining the hemopoietic stem cell, but it doesn't allow the hemopoietic stem cell to be expanded in number. So you have what you have. Um, and when people uh, for 50 or 60 years have taken hemopoietic stem cells out and put them into culture, they can keep them alive, they can get them to differentiate into lymphocytes, but they can't get them to expand. The beauty of embryonic stem cells or all the pluripotent stem cells is we can maintain them in a pluripotent stem cell state. They can divide symmetrically so they provide two daughters, both of which are embryonic stem cells, which will provide another four daughters that are, and so on and so forth. So the embryonic stem cells, the pluripotent stem cells can be expanded indefinitely, but the, um, the typically with a few exceptions, the um, hemopoietic stem cells and the somatic stem cells can't. Now, what you could potentially do is take an embryonic stem cell, turn it into a hemopoietic stem cell, ad nauseum, and make lymphocytes. As it turns out, making hemopoietic stem cells from embryonic stem cells has been very difficult to do definitively. So it's just, it, I'm sure it will be overcome, but it, you know, it's... But that said, just because you got really close to it in your question, there's, there's two things, two treatments that are in clinical trial for cancer that have come forward kind of along the lines that you're touching on. And that's where you take either you make induced pluripotent stem cells, reprogrammed stem cells or ESLs, and you make T lymphocytes and you use, you create what's called a chimeric antigen receptor, a CAR T modified cell that Cancer is really tricky. It has a lot of ways to evade detection by your own immune system. So if you can find a marker on it that's specific for the cancer cell and isn't expressed on other cells that are in your body, you can use this technique to make a CAR T engineered T cell, give those back to a patient. And some of that has shown tremendous success. So we have our first CAR T trial actually starting in the alpha stem cell clinic downstairs. The other thing you can do is expand a population of cells called dendritic cells, also a part of your immune system and do the same trick. So take a part of the tumor, teach the dendritic cells, which are a part of the normal immune system, immune response to everything that could go wrong around you. Train those up to recognize tumor cells and infuse them back into the patient. Again, we have a, a trial that's going on um, downstairs here for a uh, number of solid tumors, including ovarian uh, cancer, using engineered dendritic cells in that regard. It is it is. So I want to do two things. I want um, to thank everyone for all of your questions, because I think that's really fantastic and for people sticking here. I am glad to hang around. These guys may be going to bed, but I will stay for a while if you have additional questions to ask. I actually um, want to have Nicole Madani stand up here, who is an Irvine High School teacher. How many people are in one of Nicole's classes? I think a few people here tonight. Um, do you guys all know that Nicole worked for Brian in the Stem Cell Center when she was in high school? <laughs> so I had, to, I had to just say that out loud. And also I would like to thank um, Peter and Sid um, for their uh, lectures, their very thoughtful delivery, and um, for answering your questions.